as a package. In, indeed, the cost of training a veterinarian in South Africa, as far back as 2012, 2013, when we did the last evaluation, was about 6 million rand. 6 million rand, just do your calculation at the end of this meeting and see, you will you'll be talking in several millions of naira if you want to train a vet. So that shows you how much I've been put into you in terms of training you. And uh, and this cost, are you going to let it go to waste? That is the first question. Secondly, the objective. Why did you go in? Why are you coming out? What are your goals? What direction do you want to go? Do you, are you motivated by action or you just say, oh, let me go graduate because I've been told to graduate by my family? And how are you going to make yourself employable? And do you have enough confidence in yourself? Indeed, uh, these are some of the issues we have to begin to think in terms of our role in the modern day society. Like in the South African system where I've taught in a number of years back, in the final year, the students don't even do much classwork. They are on rotation with the industry. We send them to different clinics. We take them to farm. We take them to... And that's what they do for 10 of the 12 months in the final year. So by the time they are finishing that final year, they've already integrated themselves into the industry. They already know how to relate with people, how to, how to do business around veterinary medicine, know how to charge, and they actually take charge when we go to the field. And so another thing is that you are young, the timeline, you are young, but you will never be forever young. Indeed, I was shocked when we were graduating from the university and we used to think we were young. So not too long ago, I went home and I was asking my sister, oh, what about your first daughter? She said, the girl is in the university. I said, how can it be? This girl was just born by the time we were finishing the university. And you are telling me she's in the university now. I cannot comprehend it until I begin to take calculator and calculate. When did I graduate? How old is this girl now? This girl, as you speak now, she's also a professional like I am. And if you look at the right answer, you see that curve. It's talk about how the whole society is categorized. You are either the innovator, the early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, or the laggards. Let's take cell phone, for instance. When cell phone first came, there are some people who are interested in piloting any technology. They are the first to try it. But some people at that time say, ah, no, they said that thing gives one cancer. I will never use that thing. You wait until you see some people use it and they didn't die, then you join. Then you become early adopter. Early majority are those who wait. They are the average in the society. They don't want to pilot anything. They just want to follow. The same with the late majority. The laggards are the people who will never buy in until you drag them along. They have to be dragged along in the society. You can think of yourself as a graduate now and think which category are you or which category would you want to be going into the industry. The innovators are risk takers. They are ready to take any bull by the horn and take the challenge and they are ready to move. And they are the ones that are most successful. If you think of like uh, Zuckerberg that created uh, Facebook, if you think of uh, this guy from South Africa who is an American now, who is into so many innovations, these are innovators. They are ready to take risk because the reward system also for them is big. So I want to say congratulations to you having graduated. By the time you are now doing your pre-adoption, that means you are almost a graduate. So the, the seven quality you need to have as a, as a vet, the basic quality one, you must be able to stay calm under pressure. You will definitely have pressure. Your capacity to tolerate unpleasant situation. You will see some situation where you treat animal in the field and then the farmer may not want to pay you. Your high mental and physical stability, well, you don't need to be taught about that. I'm sure going through vet school, you already have that. Your emotional intelligence and empathy. Ability to think quick, decide fast, and come out with something. Your adaptability, enthusiasm, and positivity, as well as your communication skill. You find yourself in difficult situation, but your communication skill will be the only thing that will save you. And I'll give you an example as we go on. So being a vet, you live an interesting life, definitely. 
you can never live a boring life being an event unless you are not practicing the profession. You may not always be rich, especially rich in money. If you want to be rich in money, we also get to that. You see how you can do it. This is some of the pictures I took when we went to Gumti Gashaka National Park around 2011, 2012. You can look at this pic uh, these pictures of different animals. You can see how interesting can life be more than this. You are in tune with nature. You can, you can decide to go from domestic to wildlife to desert animal to interesting ecosystem. You can, you can traverse any ecosystem. And that's why it's easy for vets to adapt into any situation. So one, let's talk quickly about possible career paths, which are the basic thing that we know as vets. You think of diagnostic, you think of consultation and clinicals, you think of farm and food industry, you think of public health and regulatory, you think of biomedical, which include the pharmaceuticals, the biologics, the vaccines, you think of education, that means going back to lecture, maybe in the university or in the animal health schools and all those things. But we've had vets piloting the banking industry Indeed, the MD, the MD of First Bank is a vet. We've also had another MD who is a vet. We've had vets in politics. There was a time we have about five of the ministers and senior special advisors being vets in Nigeria. You can go into policy, policy making. You can go into governance. Indeed, the, the whole world is actually a template ready for you. Uh, it depends on where you want to apply yourself that will determine where you will find yourself. So, but you need to begin to ask yourself question. How do I know my interest? So even as a student, you need to begin to think, what are the things that tickles me when I was in school? If I can give you a quick example, we used to have uh, one of our senior colleagues, uh, Dr. Shegwa Kelolu, right from when we were in school, he was in interested in praise and he was interested in music. As we speak today, He's a musician. He never really practiced vet medicine. But he's a successful musician and he's... Today, he's practicing photography. He's photography moving from Nigeria to UK. He's practicing photography in the UK as we speak. So you need to begin to think, what tickles my interest? What do I enjoy doing? What if I'm wrong? It's a, poss it's a possibility that you may be wrong in the choice you make. But the good thing with the vet profession is that it's so vast that you may even confuse yourself thinking of what to select in the profession. For example, I wanted to be, I wanted to be an abattoir veterinarian when I was finishing. But when I went for my NYSE, the director I worked under, he said, you, this boy, you are going to research. Immediately you finish, I'm sending you to the research institute. And that was how I started my career. So you, you don't have to be a jack of all trades. If you pick one or two area of vet medicine and begin with that and see how it goes. If it doesn't satisfy you again, you can shift. You can do poultry, you can do anything. Another thing, how do I develop my passion? You need to think of it. What are the things you like doing? How do, do you build on it? I've given you a few examples. Are you working with like minds? In your industry, do you see like minds? For example, like when we talk of, about uh, doing things right, you need to think of who are the people that are thinking like me. I wanted to set up the best veterinary clinic in Nigeria. I have one or two of my classmates who have the same vision. Can we start together? It's possible. I know of a group of five young vets. They graduated just about two years ago in Nairobi, in Kenya. The five of them, they set up what they call the big five in Kenya. And that, that clinic is making waves now because they are right, both on the ground. They are also online. You can do consultation with them through several areas. Have you selected your secret and open role model? You may have to select a role model. We know in the situation we are in, it's difficult now to think of who should I pick as my role model. But you still need to think of who you can look up to. We have a number of them, even in our profession. So how do I package myself and create network? It's important. Are you in the right place at the right time? Do you know how to create an established network? 
And are you using your stubbornness rightly? Yeah. So, for example, as a young graduate that you are just getting into the industry now, there are times you need to be stubborn. For example, when I went for my national youth service, I went to the ministry. The first person I met told me, oh, you don't come to this ministry. They don't pay the vets their uh, regulated allowances. I said, you, they may not pay you. I will get paid. And I have my own strategy. I have my own plan. Of course, it's, I had to face some challenges. It took me almost eight, nine months before I was able to resolve it. But I have all my money paid, including the backlog of the 10 months. So then, so, but that is by using the right strategy, meeting with your stubbornness and using it rightly to get what you want. What are my benchmark? What is the minimum standard you set for yourself? I talk about a colleague who said he want to graduate from vet mercy and go and teach in primary school. That is our own benchmark. What is your own? What's your maximum benchmark? Did I go for just anything? Are you the type that say, oh, just let anything come. The average is just fine. No, you shouldn't settle for the average. It's like, that's what brings me to this uh, practical experience, the cat and the pig. There was a time I, when I used to practice in South Africa, we the, a cat was brought to the clinic and the same day a pig was brought you know at least the size of a pig compared to the size of a cat and when we estimated the cost of this pig it was valued at about 700 rand maybe around uh, some few thousand era but the owner of the cat that brought the cat put 11000 rand on the ground immediately to start treating the cat that if the money is not enough, he is ready to pay as much as possible. So now in terms of monetary value, you look at their size. If you need to place money on them, you may think of placing more money on the, on the pig. But in terms of the value, not the money now, the cat is more valuable to the owner than the pig. And that's how you need to begin to see yourself. You need to use every opportunity. And when you are out of control, for example, if you are not controlling your space, somebody else will take over. For example, if you are supposed to be the regional vet uh, doctor or you are the vet doctor for the local government, uh, even as a core member, and you are not playing your role, I will tell you the quack will take over. The less than qualified individual will take over and they will push you aside. So you need to know your role and play it rightly. So. The question is, are there still opportunities? Because you say, oh, but we keep producing vets, 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 they are not getting job. Are you thinking that way? Are you saying, oh, I will be one of those who will not get job? No, no, you should not think that way. Well, there, are, there is a conversation uh, message that was posted in 2021 that Nigeria need more vets, but getting them is a big challenge. So that means, among the cluster of vets that are produced every year, some are being filtered and selected, yet there are quite a number of them that are not uptake. How can you create opportunity for uptake for yourself? The list there down there, I put a number of opportunities that you can think around. This will be distributed. I will share it with the organizer so you, you can get a copy of it. You can have a detailed look at it. In terms of Nigeria, currently, we have over 9,000 vets on the register, but those in active practice are less than 3,500. That means there are still quite a lot of opportunities because if you look at the total number of shortfall alone from the local government, we have about 3,870 vets shortfall in the local government authorities alone. We've not talked of the state. We've not, we've not talked of the national. So it means that every vet graduated from all the 13 veterinary schools in Nigeria today can have a space tomorrow if they really want to place all of you. If you look at the number of cows, number of sheep, goats, and chicken that you can attend to per single vet, you have enough opportunity in that, in that country. So these are some of the international organizations also that take vets. This is just some selected few. There are quite a lot that I've seen much, much longer list than this. And on daily basis, people are requesting for vets. So you don't have to think of if there are people who will not get a job, I will be one of them. Rather think if there are people that will get a job, I will be one of them. They said there are two ways by which we look at issues of life. 
They said there are two people that are put in a prison bar. One look up and see the star. The other look down and see the mud. So you have to decide whether you want to be seeing the stars or you want to be seeing the mud. And if it's about money, you see, vets are well paid in other terrains. We know that in Nigeria, that's not the situation. But we need, we are pushing and we need to keep pushing until we possibly get our adequate pay. But most professions in Nigeria, we know they are underpaid compared to the inputs they have. For example, if you practice in the U.S., as a basic vet, a fresh graduate, you will get about 90000 every year as your basic salary. And then if you go ahead and specialize, maybe in the military, in vet research, or as a professor, you can get a lot, lot more as a veterinarian. So the opportunity is there for you. And I tell you, the rate at which they are recruiting a number of our vets. I've known a number of young vets that graduated from Abekota that had been recruited either in Canada now. Indeed, I followed a lady recently. She even got a job with their, I think, food inspection agency in Canada. And she's a graduate of Abekota. She went over to Canada to do a master's and PhD. And subsequently, she got employed by the system. So it means that we are producing quality graduates in Nigeria. The thing is, are we keeping them? That should be the question. And so I will not I will not begrudge any young man that want to escape the country in view of the current situation. But you can also decide to stay in the country and make something work out for you. And well, let's look at some of the things that create depression and frustration for vets. How did I get into the profession? A number of young vets do think about this. Say, oh, I want to study medicine. It's because I could not get medicine. They just gave me vet. So they just gave you vet. They gave you, over the last six, seven years, what have you done to yourself? Have you become a convert? Or you are still in that mode of they just gave me? So are you frustrated being a vet or animal health professional? Have you defined your focus? These are important things you need to consider. And what are your source of frustration? These are some of the least, no job, depression, dealing with hard decision, and all those things. What are the source of your frustration? Is it because the animal owner don't appreciate you enough or Dr. Gogo is making them to think less of you? Anytime they have problems, they first go to Gogo. Okay, my animal is having bulging stomach. What do I do? It's only when they don't have solution that they come to you. So these are some of the top 10 list of frustrations that vets face, in, especially in developing countries. Low pay, lack of benefits, Client who cannot afford, non-compliant clients, high cost of doing business. You know, you are subjected to so many taxes. Like I was reading through some documents in Nigeria yesterday. I found out they said there are almost 200 different taxes and levies regime in Nigeria, which is not good for business. Not enough time to complete duties. High turnover and lack of unqualified candidates and difficult clients. These are a list of them. So this is one big opportunity for us as vets. I tell you, I was in discussion with some colleague from World Vet Organization uh, early last year, and they said, you these vets, you keep getting yourself everywhere. Everywhere, you keep getting yourself. Here in, in WHO, you are almost taking over. In FAO, you are there. In OIE, you are there. In Codex, you are there. In, uh, in indeed, now the recently the UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, they were recruiting vets actively in the area of one health. So you have enough opportunity, both locally and globally, if I can put it that way, globally being from looking local to going global. So you have a lot of opportunity that is open to you. Don't contain yourself within your city or within your town or within your state or within your country as you are doing put in excellence locally and look globally and if you have that opportunity please take it and don't be afraid to 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 take challenge indeed i tell you the first the first uh, opportunity i had with the fao i actually competed with some of the professors who graduated me in the university i had only first degree then and when i met this professor at the interview i was feeling little bit. I said, ah, no, but we come here if I can be selected to come and compete with them. I will do it. And I did it and I got the job. And I become the consultant, even with my first degree. 
So if anybody tell you until you have PhD or you become a prof before you can serve as consultant, it's not true. One, another thing we need to look at is IT and modern technology. It's like, if you say you are not going to take IT and modern tech and introduce it into your profession now, it's like you are telling us that you don't want to enter a vehicle at this age. You still want to be using leg or you want to be using donkeys like we do in those years. People are doing online consultation now. You can set up your business and do online consultation. Marketing vet and animal products online is good that uh, Pharma Lat is also on this platform. I know that they do that. Integrating technology into your practice. Don't only think, oh, if I'm in the rural area, I cannot do anything unless if I go to the urban, urban and city area. No, you may start your practice. Like the, the, you see the largest head of animal, the largest head of cattle I've seen in my life was when I went towards Gumti Gashaka area. They have quite a lot of enormity of animals there. You can never go broke being a vet in such a community. So, but you need to learn how to showcase your skill as I've said before, and you need to embrace lifelong learning. If you see your senior colleague do it better than you in one way, or you see one of your former professors that you studied under, you need to, to learn about an issue or you need to resolve an issue. You can give them a call. You can say, hey, Dr. Agbaje, I want to ask you about this. Please, uh, Dr. Akande, I want to ask your opinion about this. You don't need to be shy about it. Everybody is learning at every stage of our life. You need to understand the necessity of networking. It's very, very important. If you create a network, it will determine your net worth. So if you don't have the right network, you find out you will limit yourself and then you find a lot of opportunity will keep passing you right, left and center. And you need to master the life work balance. It's important for us to also create time for our life, create time for your family, create time to rest. So yes, I will be concluding with this. Now there's, this is the way to go. So the question is, let us go. What are the key successful factors to starting your own business? And the business, I mean here, yeah, does not mean veterinary business. It doesn't mean setting up a business or buy and selling. It. it can be anything you think of doing after graduation. It's your business. First, you need to set your clear vision and mission. You can take a piece of book and say, okay, this is my book. I will put everything down in this book and I will be reviewing it maybe every, every month to see whether I have clarity. If I don't have clarity, if I need to consult, I will consult until I get better. If you look at one big clinic and you see this is what I want to model after, go sit the person down. If you look at Pharma Lat as an example, you say, oh, I want to build a business like that. And you don't know, call him. And if he did not respond to you, call some of us who can speak to him. We will get him to respond to you and to respond to your need. You need to conduct market research. For example, I was talking to a young person in Kenya. He wanted to set up a, a, a shop where he would be selling cell phones. He would be going to China, buying and selling in, in the market in Kenya. And I asked him, what is your plan? He told me his strategy. Oh, I will get a shop in the major cell phone market in, in Nairobi. I will do this. I will do that. I said, wait, have you done the market evaluation? Have you conducted your market research? Like in that area, how many, how many other cell phone sellers are there? When I did the evaluation with him, we have about 150 other cell phone sellers. And these are established sellers. You are just coming into the market. You'll be investing over 3 million into shop over a four-year period. And you want to compete with this individual. I told him, your business will die before the end of first year. In that wise, why don't you think of by bringing in your cell phone from China, yes. Instead of going, go online, create a marketing brand online for yourself. Then go to secondary school, go to primary school, negotiate with their cooperative union and tell them, do you know I can distribute cell phone to all of you? You pay me over six months. You pay me in installment over six months. And you, and you negotiate with the managers of the cooperative union. Say, if you are able to help me manage this process and I get all my money, 
your union. I will give you 5% at the end of the day. And you will build those 5% business uh, interest into the cost. You are selling it to them. So in this wise, over that six-month period, the number of school you can get times the number of staff they have, you can sell that number of cell phones. If you go start in that competitive space with those who, who will subsume you in less than six months, you will die a natural death. Your, your business will die of attrition. So you need to also develop a unique value proposition. What is the unique thing you are bringing into the table? For example, if I'm coming in as a clinician or I'm coming in as a practitioner in large animal medicine or I'm coming in as a production animal medicine person, what is the unique value? What makes me different from every other vet that are there on the ground? You can, if it takes you six months to sit and think of that before you deliver it, it's better. You, so also develop a solid business plan. At times, you may need to use uh, people who know how to do business plan. You may need to, to sit with them. Give them your idea. Tell them what you want, and they will help you to develop. And be adaptable and innovative. Develop the leadership style you want. Do you want to be a boss in your practice, or you want to work as a colleague with your team member and grow together. You must be customer focused. If you really want to make it, you must be people focused and be financially disciplined. Uh, I, I once consulted for a farm in South Africa. This lady started from four sow units, moved into 30 sow units through our assistance and moved into 120 sow units. So she, be, she thought she's become big. When she got her first big sale from the farm, she went to buy a big baki. Baki is what we call pickup fan, the, the fancy pickup fan. She bought a new one. She put a big boom box in it. She changed the seat in her home, changed everything. I, we went to visit. I said, Madam, this is not the right thing to do. The first money you make from farm is not really your money. It's supposed to be going back into reinvestment. I tell you, Two months down the line, she was not able to find money to feed an animal. It become an animal welfare issue, and they have to tell her to downsize the farm. She downsized to less than, I think, 25 sow units at the end of the day. So you also need to have an effective marketing and branding system, and you must be resilient and persistent. I would like to stop at this stage so that we can have room for some interaction. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's, that's a very good question and it's a reality. And we know in the context of the situation of the country, we cannot push it away. One, the, you know, they say when preparation meets opportunity, that's when they say the person is lucky. One, during your national service, we talk about networking and, and uh, connection. For example, let's say you start in a state and you want to be retained in that state. Have you as an individual or the team of you young vet who is serving in that state as vets, have you made effort to reach out to maybe the NVMA chairman of that state, the, uh, the director of vet services of that state, the, the relevant or the high sounding or high sounding names in terms of clinics and all those things in that place and discuss with them and discuss opportunities, discuss challenges, discuss some of the limitations with them. That's one thing. Secondly, have you actually have your own plan? For example, when I was serving, I already have a plan that if I if I finish my NYSC and I didn't get a job, all the money I made based on my call duty allowance and everything, I want to start a farm immediately. And because I got a job immediately, what I did was to put that money into port 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 portfolio investment immediately. So I did not use the money at the end of the day to start the clinic because what I was thinking was different from what happened to me. I may say I was lucky. It may not be everybody that will be that lucky, but you still need to have a plan. You see, when you don't have a plan, even when the opportunity comes, you will misuse it. If you already have a plan, even if you don't have, don't, don't actually base your plan based on whether I have the money or I don't have the money. You just make the plan first. Then it will set you thinking. 
And when you begin to think, you will begin to find out some of the area you may not even think of. For example, you may find out, oh, there is one of my uncle that has some loose money somewhere that is not using. You can go to talk to him and say, uncle, come and invest in my business. If you invest in this business over the next two, three years, I'm telling you, I'm going to be paying you this and pay you this and pay you this and return all your money and give you this in addition. Or you may want to form partnership with me. And let's go into partnership together. It's possible. I've seen young people who went into such opportunity. I've seen young people who start from basically nothing and who admit something of themselves. Indeed, there was a young vet I met on LinkedIn just about a year ago. He graduated as a vet doctor, moved to the US. He, he moved into the tech industry and they were struggling, struggling. They were able to do everything. At the end of the day, the first product they were bringing to the market, they've been able to raise between himself and his partner, who is a computer scientist, they've been able to raise 1.8 million US dollar to start. And this is just somebody like you. He's not different from you. He does not come with two head. So if you can do it, you need to begin to think innovatively because really the environment is challenging. And unfortunately, I should be realistic with you. Not everybody will be that lucky to start. So but you just need to think of using your network, using your connection, using your innovation, using your ideas to begin to think of how to make life a bit easier for you before you start. And don't think of, you don't need to start at the very high level. You can start from low level. For example, the first time I met uh, Dr. Charles Ebe, you may all know him, Blue Bat. The first time I met him, he, he was telling us about how he started carrying vaccine on motorcycle to go and distribute in farms. Today, he imports vaccine easily from Europe, from America, from everywhere. So it's, it can be challenging starting, but don't look at the starting point. Look at your end goal with regards to this type of issue. That would be my advice. And the second question, making money and apprenticeship, which will you prioritize while knowing how hard the economic is and the desire to fit? Yes, definitely. Uh, this is a question that challenge a lot of people, especially it won't come from a low background. And I tell you, most of us actually come from low background. So if you see anybody and you tell the person, oh, please sit down with me and tell me your beginning. Indeed, I was chatting with some young vets in, in Tanzania at one time. And one of them looked at me and said, hey, prof, I would like to be like you. And I said, you, really, you would like to be like me? He said, yes. I said, oh, would you like to know how I started? I said, okay, the first time when I was serving, I served in a very good place in Abuja. And I was given a three bedroom, fully furnished flat. But immediately when I moved to Vaughan and I have to start, do you know I started in a, in a mud house? I, the first house I live in in Vaughan, in MVRI, was a mud house after my first month in the guest house of the district. And that mud house, we just bought a bed, we put it on the floor. I cannot even have a, a, a bed to place the mattress on. So we started on the floor and I was planning to get married at that time and all those things. I said, that was how I started. He said, really? I said, yes, that is really. That's the truth because it would be a fallacy to tell you, oh, with one grain of rice, I can make a million. It's not true. A lot of people you see I up there today, they've gone through their lowest moments. Indeed, I listened to one motivational speaker yesterday. They were asking him, oh, how much do you make? He said he made about a $2 million dollars a year uh, a year now in sale and they said oh really have you have you experienced poverty he said oh he said there was a time he could not even afford a house he had to be sleeping inside his car he uses his car for sale and he was sleeping inside the car because he couldn't even afford the house and that is the reality so don't ever look at your low beginning have a vision and pursue that vision with all your dedication and I tell you, the, the, the sky is the limit. The best 
the best opportunity you've given to yourself is having gone through the veterinary education. It makes you very adaptable and make you very resilient. You can find yourself in any place and you can create an opportunity. I had a vet uh, friend, he's in the UK now. He wanted to move into the tech industry. He had been in vet and research all his life. He wanted to move into the tech industry and he called me, he said, Egbert, let's chat. So we chatted and we talked. He said he wanted to move into this industry. He said he would go there and tell them everything he knew about vet medicine and blend it with whatever I can do. Do you know he got hired and he was not just got hired in the position he was applying for. He got hired and was placed as a manager over people who are in the tech, in that industry. That is the power of being a vet. So if you use your skill rightly and you combine it with your ability to talk and to convince, you may find yourself where you don't even think that you will be. That would be my advice with regards to this second question. Um. Thank you very much. Um, um, the normal domestic. Uh, okay. The, the normal okay. domestic medicine. You can check the chat. Yes, I've seen it on the chat. Yeah, I can tell you wildlife vet medicine uh, more difficult when you look at it. It may it may not be depending on how you look at it. In in a country like Nigeria, in most West African country, because we've poached almost all our wildlife. It's difficult to actually have the wildlife to practice with. But if you are in Eastern Africa, if you are in Southern Africa, oh, there is a lot of opportunity for wildlife uh, vet medicine, and it's a prestigious uh, position. Indeed, the, the wildlife vets that I know in South Africa, at one time, it went to, to handle a case. And for handling that one case, what he gets in in terms of payment for that one case was more than my one month salary as a professor in the university in Pretoria. And I was not cheaply paid then as a professor. So it's, it's, not, it's not true that wildlife medicine is not valuable as we, we may want to think in, in Nigeria or in West Africa. It is not also true that it is very difficult. It's just that you need to connect with opportunity. For example, if you want to do wildlife vet medicine, if, if, let's say you are registered for the postgraduate program in Nigeria. I will say that spend part of your time, part of your study time, spend it outside, either in East Africa or Southern Africa, and integrate yourself into the community. Let me give you an instance. There was a time we wanted to recruit. We were looking for interns for a particular project under me, and we wanted to recruit six interns, and we wanted the intern to come actually from Tanzania. I was in Tanzania at that time. And we made the call. There was this application from a young guy from US. I will never forget in my life. This young man, the way he packaged his CV, it was difficult to just ignore him. Because by every criteria we look at, his CV just came up outstanding. What did he do? You know, this is your six weeks, uh, six weeks, uh, uh, six weeks attachment that we do. Seawaste. Yes, the seawaste. The six, for, for, for her, um, uh, every six weeks that she asked, she come, she, she had been to Zimbabwe. She worked with the uh, uh, wildlife authority in Zimbabwe for six weeks. She had been to Kenya. She worked with them for six weeks. She had been to Tanzania. She worked with them for six weeks. She had been to, I, even, I think she even went to Yankari at one time. So by the time we were talking of experience, she displayed all this experience. So it was difficult to find a way to eliminate her because we want to take local individual. So we have to take her and take five other locals to complete the six uh, interns that we're looking for for that project. So this is how you need to take important. Every little thing you think you've done that you think may not matter. They may be the thing that matter most when it comes to your evaluation in the near future. So you need to go back and relook at, go back and think over your last six, seven, eight years and think of yourself and go, take your CV and rejig it along those lines. And your CV should be a living document. Again, that is how I want to end. Your CV is a living document. If your CV, you don't touch it every two months, then what you are telling us is that you yourself, you are dead. 
Because if, if are you telling me you've not made progress over the last two months or three months or five months or six months in your life? If you have made it, then you need to include that new new thing into your CV because it's your CV that is your marketer. If, where you where you send your CV to is when they evaluate the CV or they evaluate your dossier first. That's when they can reach out to you. But when you package your CV and for the last two years, you've not even touched it, the same thing that was there two years ago is what was there today. Then what you are telling us, you are not living. I tell you as late as yesterday, I still reviewed my CV. Thank you very much. I think we can go on and on, um, Prof. Uh, but because of our time here, uh, it's already getting very dark in Nigeria here. So I will call it short as um, that being the last um, question. Let me appreciate you as always um, because you're always our go-to person. Each time um, we are boxed to the corner and um, I can assure that you never disappoint. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I will hand over the mic now to Dr. Akande to give a vote of thanks. And from there, we can say au revoir to tomorrow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Baje, thank you for a job well done. Student, thank you for your patience. In spite of all the itches, we appreciate you. Thank you to our online audience. And uh, Dr. Fashino, no, Professor Fashino, thanks for being our go-to person. We appreciate your time. And um, we are grateful for even responding at very, very short notice. We hope when as we come knocking, you will still accept us the way we are. On behalf of the Dean Colbert, and the entire induction team, we want to say thank you, everybody. Do enjoy your evening, and then we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>